Economic Development Senior Citizen Homeland Security now reconvenes this uh, public hearing. The time now is 2.03 p.m. And uh, the agenda for this afternoon is Bill 143, uh, which is relative to expanding the Natasha Protection Act of 2005 to smoking um, regulation, providing increased enforcement and providing for enforcement training. I want to thank, of course, the Vice Speaker for joining me this morning and, and um, Senator Nerissa Underwood. Thank you very much uh, for joining me and for all of you for being here. I know it's um, Friday. It's uh, right in the middle of the, the work day. It's almost 5 o'clock. We start our weekend, but you still took the time to, to come out for this important measure. Um, before I, I, I acknowledge the, um, the first set of um, individuals who wish to testify, I want to, of course, recognize and welcome here Ms. Jenny Garrett, uh, who is the mother of the namesake of uh, the No Smoking uh, Natasha Protection Act of Guam. So thank you very much uh, for being here this afternoon. <clears throat> Bill 143 um, is introduced with myself and uh, a few other colleagues, uh, Senator Wampat, Respicio, Barnes, uh, McCready, Tony Atta, Vice Speaker, Senator Morrison, and Senator Underwood. I thank them for co-sponsoring. What this bill does is actually, there's three, three components of the bill. Uh, the first component is that it extends the uh, enforcement of the Natasha Protection Act. It, uh, uh, if this bill passes, it would um, empower CAPE volunteers, uh, private security personnel, uh, to be able to uh, enforce the Natasha Protection Act. We know that enforcement has been a, a big problem. Um, if you leave it just to the police department, we understand that there are higher priorities um, that take, um, that are, 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 ten are tended to first, you know, and so we want to be able to um, expand this enforcement by um, having these um, individuals be able to enforce the, the law, um, but not before they go through a, a comprehensive training. And so that is part of the, um, the bill which calls for training for these, um, for these individuals. The uh, second part of the bill is that it uh, now uh, includes bars as a no smoking establishment. Uh, it it um, really expands the, the Clean Air Act and it helps and protects um, those uh, from secondhand smoke. You know, the entertainers and industry workers who work in these places, sometimes they don't really uh, have a choice. It's their livelihood, they have to be there. So we want to be able to, um, you know, have their voices heard as well. And the third component of this bill is that it now uh, makes the smoking in a vehicle when a child is present um, a, f a primary offense. The law now uh, states that this is a secondary offense, so a police officer would have to cite uh, a first uh, violation in order to be able to cite someone uh, who is smoking the vehicle when um, a child is present. Um, so that is really the... Um, the three components of the bill. I want to thank uh, Liz Guerrero, the NCD Consortium, of course, the Tobacco um, Coalition. Uh, we've worked um, very closely. We've, we've it's taken a very long time. Um, Liz will tell you to put this together. Uh, we, we've, you know, also reached out to industry um, people in in, in bars. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have um, the full support, and in, in, in anything we do, we, we really don't have that full support. You can't please everybody. But as, as much as possible, I've reached out to them. I'm going to continue to reach out to, to other sectors of the community um, before uh, we move this forward into the, the floor um, because I think it's important that we get as much input for the community. And so we're here today to start that process with this public hearing. And, and now I'd like to um, acknowledge the, the four individuals in front of us to please provide their testimony. Uh, Ms. Jenny Garrett, Ms. Kathy Castro, Dr. Titano, and Mr. Um, right there, Tyrone. I can't read the, the rest, but if you can just um, state your name for the record when you do testify. Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Um, Thanks, thank you for the opportunity to um, testify today. My name is Genevieve Leon Guerrero Garrett. I'm the mother to the deceased Natasha Leon Guerrero Perez, the namesake to no smoking in restaurants here on Guam. 
For the senators today who might not know the background of the Natasha Protection Act, please allow me the opportunity to share the heart of the child behind the law. My daughter passed away from osteosarcoma nine years ago. She was 11 years old at the time of her diagnosis. She had a rare form of bone cancer that eventually overtook her lungs. At the time, we sought treatment in Michigan and finally New York City's uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Eventually, after the reoccurrence of the cancer through her lungs on numerous occasions, uh, there was little hope for a cure or an extended gift of, gift of life, so we decided to return back to Guam. Tosh was very fortunate, though, that she was um, well enough when we did come back for her to attend the Academy of Our Lady of Guam, and she was able to go to school up till her sophomore year. She ranked in the top 10 in her class. She loved eating. She enjoyed her favorites, Firefly, if you remember the restaurant, and the Japanese foods outside of her grandmother's red rice and fried chicken. She enjoyed reading, but being lung compromised discouraged her from being more physically active. So reading and writing became her favorite pastime activity. She excelled in language arts. If you would just allow me just to read it, only because I think it's important you hear her voice. Um, one of her last essays that she wrote, and I'll just read you a portion. Um, if you can go ahead and... I have a copy of her book. Uh, for those who may not know, um, on her one-year death anniversary, we had put together um, a series of her writings and our story together of her journey through cancer, more of a faith-based uh, book. Um, that is your copy. And... In the meantime, too, the Payless uh, Community um, Foundation had funded it, and all the proceeds always went to uh, cancer-related activities and given to children or people with cancer. This is Tasha's essay called Unrealistically Real. I had the best dream I ever had last night. I guess I owe it to my English teacher who gave me a creative writing assignment yesterday. Yesterday started off just as any other day, I went to school and hung out with my friends until the bell rang. Then I headed towards first period, in my case, English two honors. About 10 minutes into when the bell rang, our teacher passed out a test that we had taken the week before. I looked down at the paper just to find another A plus with the comment that said, Natasha, keep up with your amazing work. I stuffed my test into my folder and started to gather my things before the period was over. Just when I thought I was home free, our teacher told us that we had to write an essay about our, our ideal world and society. Oh great, more homework as I mumbled and walked out of the door. After school, my mom picked me up and we went home. I went to my room and started writing about my perfect world. Once I finished, I had dinner, and then I took a shower. After the, an hour of television viewing, I headed to bed. That's when it all started, the best dream I ever had. My dream contained everything, every place, and everyone that I loved. It started off with Guam and New York City being right, located right next to each other. I love Broadway, and I have a lot of friends in the city. So what would be better than having my home and the city in the same place? Plus, New York had some amazing food. I would never have to worry if I could not find what I was craving for. I could have my red rice and fried chicken or some authentic Italian or Greek food whenever I wanted, I wanted it. Another thing I wrote in my essay was there would be a cure for everyone with anything. My perfect world did not have anyone in pain or in sorrow. Wheelchairs, crutches, and pain medication were no longer needed. People were always healthy until God wanted them in heaven. One other important aspect of my perfect world was friendliness. There was no one who was mean, jealous, or impatient. There were no backstabbers, murderers, or telemarketers. Everyone would get along and be happy. Obviously, this would never happen, but my dream felt unrealistically real. Anyway, it goes on to say, but you kind of get her humor and you kind of get the gist of the spirit of the child in the essay. Um, 
So stepping back in time 11 years ago, December 2005, the popularity of Natasha Protection Act was not embraced by businesses for the fear of the end of tourism as we know it. And calls to the radio station echoed the same response. Senator Lou Leon Guerrero, Senator Judy Wampat, and Senator B.J. Cruz were not popular for this legislation at the time. If you recall, our Attorney General in 2006 even placed a restraining order to prevent the Natasha Protection Act to moving forward. I'm sorry. On June 9, 2006, Attorney Mike Phillips represented and defended the Natasha Protection Act in the Superior Court of Guam as a personal capacity as a private citizen in order to enforce the law. Judge, Superior Court Judge Stephen Pinko dismissed the case filed by the Office of the Attorney General. I don't know if you remember if anyone else in this room recalls. What you may not recall is on that same day that the case was being heard, my daughter passed away that morning. Many people became passionate about the Natasha Protection Act after her death. I recalled a week before her passing, my daughter shared, it's not going to go through, Mom. I responded, sometimes people are willing to take a stand after a child dies. Although Tosh did not know that her hopes for a smoke-free environment would be a law before her death. Here we are today, 10 years later, perhaps a bit more support from our community. I might even go on the limb here and say that a few businesses establishment would even, or that few would contest the updated legislation. I doubt if but a handful of citizens would even call the radio station that, like they did 10 years ago. The revisions to the Natasha Protection Act will provide the needed enforcement and education necessary to embrace the intention and the spirit of the law. Sometimes we need to be reminded not just about how or why we need certain laws to being supported, but sometimes we need to be reminded who the people these laws are intended to protect. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for that. Thank you. Kathy? Good afternoon. Half a day, Senator Rodriguez, Senator Underwood, and Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz. My name is Catherine Marie Rivera Castro, and I'm writing in support of Bill Number 143-33. My youngest son, although an adult, was diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer and has been battling this disease for several years. He currently is in the mainland undergoing active treatment and has yet to be in remission. Since his diagnosis, I have been very outspoken about cancer, health issues in our community, as well as different medical and health concerns and challenges facing our people. My son has had to travel off island for treatment numerous times that was not available here, so are very, we are very familiar with the struggles hardships, burden it places not only in the individual fighting for their lives, but on the family as well. I know for a fact how being on an island where so oftentimes limited resources regarding specialized health care can often affect the outcome of one's recovery. So it is very imperative that we find ways to lead healthier lifestyles and promote an environment conducive of minimizing health-related conditions and diseases. Ultimately, in doing this, it not only makes each of us healthier, but it makes an easier burden on our healthcare system, our finances, and our resources. As a mother and now a grandmother, a bill such as this is one that I'm very much in favor of. Being a responsible adult and parent and ensuring the well-being of those we love and care for is one of our primary responsibilities and obligation. To make the environment they live in a healthier one is one way of fulfilling this. I have seen how secondhand smoking can cause physical hardship to those that are within the vicinity of the smoker. More often than not, when entering an establishment, I will see someone standing around smoking near the entrance. I have personally have experience where I must cross their paths in order to enter. 
Although in certain instances there are visible signs that smoking is prohibited within 20 feet of the entrance, yet it is simply ignored. It causes me much distress and difficulty in breathing, even if it's only momentarily as I enter the establishment. I shudder to think what this exposure and situation will do to those that are experiencing medical and health issues. These individuals must fight with their health challenges and it should be our moral and ethical obligation to do what we can to assist them in improving their quality of life. I am aware that the, the environment will be a challenge, the, the enforcement will be a challenge and prove to be difficult at best. However, this should never be a reason to not make the attempt to try and enforce the law, as well as provide assistance to those individuals that are attempting to enforce the law. I'm never one to be afraid of a challenge, especially if it means improving the lives of all within our community. For those battling medical hardships, their efforts should be focused simply on battling their health issues. And for the rest of us, we should all unite to fight the battle of improving the quality of life by building and providing a safer and healthier community to live in. And ultimately, we all win. I respect the rights of the smoker. However, I also feel that the non-smoker is often placed in a position where the choice is not so clear cut. Yet if we all work together to allow the smoker a reasonable place to smoke, taking into consideration protecting the non-smoker, we, we can appease all. And regarding the matter of smoking in a vehicle where a minor is present to become a primary offense, I also feel that we should protect the rights of the minor for most often they have no say in whether the smoking in the car should cease or not. I also wish to bring up another concern that this provision should include pregnant women in the vehicle. Data has shown that second and third hand smoke is detrimental and damaging to the health and safety of the unborn child. There have been studies that these unborn babies upon birth are born with birth defects and severe medical complications as well as numerous conditions, yet they have no say about the exposure to the smoke. Once again, we have a moral and ethical obligation to protect them. I thank you for the opportunity, and I keep you and all your fellow colleagues in the legislature in my heart of prayers as we continue to improve the quality of life for each of us, one law at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am wearing my white coat today for the effect, and I hope it works. Half a day, I am John Ray Titano, president of the Guam Medical Society, speaking in support of Senator Rodriguez's bill relative to expanding the Natasha Protection Act. For far too long, smokers have been allowed to smoke around children and non-smokers and in cars transporting children. For far too long, smokers have endangered the health and well-being of our children and the silent masses afraid to show disrespect for their elders. For far too long, we have ignored the telltale signs of smoking-related diseases such as lung cancer, lip and tongue cancer, nasopharyngeal and cervical cancer, chronic obstructive lung disease, strokes and heart attacks. The time is now to stop further exposure to second and third hand smoking-related diseases and to galvanize the community toward making Guam the poster child for helping our children and our future generations avoid smoking-related diseases. The Guam Medical Society applauds Senator Rodriguez and the other senators co-sponsoring this bill, which is the vanguard of a community-driven initiative to decrease smoking-related diseases on Guam. Enlisting community resources and empowering multi-agencies to become stakeholders in the enforcing and educating the community would develop ownership in this program to ensure its success. This, legisl this legislation empowers village mayors, business owners, security companies, public health, and CAPE volunteers to enforce the law. This model legislation may be a springboard for Hawaii and Pacific Island jurisdictions to use as a template in their jurisdictions to further their anti-tobacco programs and to improve the health of the community, especially for our youth. The Guam Medical Society thanks everyone for his or her support in helping to enact this legislation into law. I'm also the president of the Cancer Council of the Pacific Islands that have asked me to, to render a testimony for that too. Dear Senator Rodriguez and members of the Guam Legislature, the Cancer Council of the Pacific Islands, or CCPI, 
is a United States affiliated Pacific Island regional organization comprised of health leaders from each of the USAPI jurisdictions whose prime vision is for a cancer free Pacific. Strongly supports this bill. Especially in regards to smoking regulations, providing increased enforcement and providing for enforcement training. One of the main goals of the CCPI and the Pacific Regional Comprehensive Cancer Control, or PRCCC, plan is to reduce the burden of preventable cancers. At the top of this list are tobacco-related cancers. Each USAPI suffers from high burdens of tobacco-related cancers. Lung and related respiratory cancers are number one and number two in most jurisdictions, number one in Guam. If you combine other non-lung cancers with, where tobacco is a known factor in development of cancer, most cancers of the head, neck, breast, colorectal, uterus, stomach, and invasive cervical cancers, then in Guam for the period 2007 to 2012, 56% of adult cancers, more than half, are tobacco-related. It is of note that this amount of tobacco-related cancers is higher than the overall USAPI, 47% for the same time period. So Guam holds a higher uh, rate, if you will. Prior to serious tobacco legislation like the Natasha Act and others, Guam adults and youth had, um, had among the highest smoking rates in the U.S. and the U.S. API the high rate of tobacco-related cancers being seen now is likely due to heavy smoking rates in the past 30 to 40 years. Expanding the Natasha Protection Act will help to protect the current youth and non-smokers from becoming ill from smoking. Besides cancer, second and third hand smoke exposure is highly related to chronic lung disease, frequent ear and respiratory infections and health consequences to unborn children exposed in utero. These issues not only impact health, but also impact economic productivity, ability to work, and quality of life. This bill directly addresses the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, Article 8, which support adoption and implementation of, for effective legislative, executive, administrative, and other measures providing for protection from exposure to tobacco smoke in indoor workplaces, public transport, indoor public places, and as appropriate, other public places. Enforcement by private citizens, business owners, community, lead community leaders is needed to make the law effective. The CCPI applauds you all in these efforts. The other USAPI jurisdictions who also struggle with important issues look to Guam for lessons learned in this challenging but critically important endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? My name is Wayne Brown. I'm with uh, Department of Public Health Social Services, NCD Community Garden Group. Innocently, uh, I'd say three, maybe three and a half, four years, uh, working with the other groups, of course, that's alcohol, tobacco, et cetera, cancer. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, observe and pay attention to our other groups. As like I said, innocently enough, uh, eating healthy, living healthy uh, encompasses all what we do. Uh, losing so many friends, 28 in one year, 14 the next, 10 the next, and this year alone I lost six, but I managed to save three. Long story made short, because I'll try to keep this brief. I'm all for the Natasha Act, however the wording may be, okay? Uh, one of my concerns is enforcement. I've had enough problems with GPD, rent -a cops security personnel, PSA, Denanchi. I can go down the whole list. I see obvious violations. I've had run-ins with them myself, and uh, well, for an example, I have personalized handicap license plates. Even the airport police hassles me about my placard. I don't need a placard. It's in the glove box because it's a personalized handicap license plate. The enforcement of this is related to that other issue. If you can't enforce it, it's not going to do any good. My neighborhood store, I'm not going to mention the name, I know the owners. We had an issue 
So he called me and he goes, Wayne, can you help us out on something? I go, sure. So I go back into the security room and I'm watching my neighbor adults buying the cigarettes and beer and they think it's okay to go out into the parking lot to give it to the underage kids. Now, how are you going to enforce that? So when I confront the neighbors, I tell them straight out. I saw you on the video camera. Now I know where the kids are getting the beer and the cigarettes and littering the neighborhood. Okay, that's, that's another area that however your wording is, make it punishable and make it stick. Because they're underage, but the adults are still going to do it. Say, for example, I've been approached many times. Uh, let's say a six-pack of beer is $8. The kids will offer you 10 or 12 Let's say the average price of a pack of cigarettes is 6 bucks, or uh, chewing tobacco, snuff, whatever you want to call it. I'll leave out the e-cigarettes. That's uh, another issue. They're going to do the same thing. They're going to have an adult buy it. Now, only because I seen it on the video surveillance camera. I witnessed it. So however your wording is, if the store security personnel sees it, enforce it. Because the adult is buying it for the underage people. Okay. Uh, the bone cancer thing. Uh, this hits really close to home because it's was my next door neighbor. I moved from Barragata to Mangalau. The whole family Ohana smokers. And <laughs> the whole family's on the welfare. You name it. Quest, SNAP, food stamps, assistance, whatever. Uh, fundraisers. Uh, I'm only bringing this up because of the bone cancer thing. You know, it hits home. child went to the mainland uh, I think it was 2012 2013 now the poor kid has to go back off island again we thought it was in remission so the parents went ahead and made another baby and the cancer runs in the whole family they already lost three uncles so to me it's related whether the smoking is direct or secondhand but the awareness is not there. That doesn't give you the right to go make another baby. I'm done. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Wayne. Do you have any questions for him? No? Good? Okay. We, we have a bunch of you who have signed up for written testimony, so we'll ensure that we um, include your written testimony in our committee report. Um, I'll call the ones who marked oral testimony. Um, there's one name here. I don't know if it's Ike. He's from the UOG. Um, Luke, okay, I'm sorry, I can't. Please, if you can come forward. Luke, I'm very sorry. I murdered your name. Um, Kaylee Terlahi. Mr. Gillen, is that, um, was that, please, if you, yes. Okay. Okay, please, and then, yes. <laughs> okay, sir. Yes, you're ready. Spencer. When is an off day, Chairman Rodriguez, an honorable senator of the 33rd Guam Legislature? This testimony is presented on behalf of the Social Work Student Alliance of the University of Guam. Swasa thanks you for this opportunity to present this testimony in support of Bill 143-33. My name is Luke Duenas and I'm a senior in the social work program. I have been smoke free for seven years and has since then experienced a secondhand smoke when standing downwind from an individual who is smoking. People shall not have to be inconvenience nor have to walk around to avoid the smoke being emitted by a person who is not in compliance with the law that prohibits smoking within 20 feet of the service entrance of business establishments. It is our organization's position 
that business owners should take action and responsibility to ensure that security providers receive the necessary training as proposed in this amendment of the Natasha Protection Act of 2005. We feel there's a lack of compliance for most business establishments to properly post signs of the law. Considering the fact that this is the 10th year review of the Natasha Protection Act of 2005, it begs the question, what excuses are there for business establishments not being able to abide by the law and give the courtesy to its non-smoking patrons? With, a, with allowing security personnel and volunteers to enforce the provision of the Natasha Protection Act, we should see an increase in the sanctioning of smokers violating this law. Hence, this amendment is necessary in order to improve our island's community's overall health. The proposed expansion on the Natasha Protection Act of 2005 allows community volunteers to assess the enforcement of the provision of the law. This is to be applauded. However, the bill requires that volunteers to be citizens of the United States and residents of Guam. We propose that residents who are interested in volunteering to enforce this law to be allowed to do so without being citizens of the United States. This will open up possibilities to non-U.S. citizens who would like to contribute to the health of our local community. It would afford them the opportunity to assist and become further integrated into our island society. Hence, Swasa rec recommends broadening the requirements to be simple residents of Guam. Thank you. Hafide, my name is Kaylee Trelahi. The Social Work Student Alliance stands in support of expanding the Natasha Protection Act of 2005 in hopes of increasing its provisions for enforcement. University of Guam, tobacco free. We see these signs posted around campus, but we do not see, see it being enforced. Whether it is in the parking lot, between buildings, or under the tree in front of the library, smoking is still a common occurrence on campus. As students of the university, UOG is one of the places in our everyday lives where we feel we should be safe from the harmful effects of smoking. It is not, a, not uncommon to see people, whether staff or student, look the other way when the act of smoking is visible. We are in favor of expanding the act because it serves as a voice for those of us who may not have much of a choice otherwise. With the amendment to the Natasha Protection Act of 2005, we hope to see more security personnel and community volunteers enforcing the smoking ban on campus. We hope to feel the lift of polluted air clouding our campus. Thank you. Hafide, my name is Mokihana Kahela. The Social Work Student Alliance is in full support of expanding the Natasha Protection Act of 2005. We stand before you to insist on the enforcement of restricting the use of tobacco products in motor vehicles in the presence of minors. Considering the extremely high smoking rates, it is not uncommon to find an individual smoking in the presence of a child. Tobacco use in vehicles should be viewed as a form of child abuse. To say that secondhand smoke is an inconvenience is an understatement when it, is, when it has the potential to seriously harm an individual. Not only does it have the potential to harm or to be harmful, but it is also found to be deadly in regards to its exposure amongst children and adults alike. Secondhand smoke causes numerous diseases in children, including asthma and pneumonia, which results in avoidable medical care. Secondhand smoke is a major cause of sudden infant death syndrome, cancerous diseases, and heart attacks, all of which are medical issues affecting our community in high rates. When, ch when a child is exposed to secondhand smoke in a vehicle, the small concentrated space increases the lethality of the child's exposure to secondhand smoke derived from tobacco products. It is because the proposed expansion to the Natasha Protection Act of 2005, which greatly benefits our community in ensuring a healthier environment for Guam, that the Social Work Student Alliance supports or stands in support of this bill. Sejuas Maasi. Thank you very much um, for that testimony. And uh, Mr. Gillen, before you continue, I just want to um, highlight your part of the testimony. Um, this past weekend, Sunday, I was at the um, one of the, the malls, the parking lot, waiting for my wife at Payless, and I was showing Senator Underwood a picture. There was a couple uh, who um, had a child. Um, they, were, they were parked, so if a uh, cop would come over or a peace officer 
they wouldn't be able to cite them because they're, you know, they're not moving. There's no other violation. The only violation was that um, the mother and father had their three-week-old baby. Um, the mother was holding and um, was smoking. Both of them were smoking. So I, I, you know, of course, I, I don't have the training, but I politely asked them, you know, if, if they could stop. And I just told them why. And, you know, they were nice. So I was lucky. I didn't get beat up. <laughs> I was lucky, you know. So, but yeah, you know, this is a, a picture. Uh, this was at one of the malls here. And I said, you know, it happened Sunday. I said, boy, here we are. We're just, you know, we're, we're set to have this, this hearing um, today. And I saw it before my eyes, you know. And, and that just, it just, um, it just, you know, motivated me even more to that, say that we need this type of um, legislation. So thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Okay, Mr. Gillen. Thank you, uh, Senator. It's nice to see you again. Um, and we're talking the same story again, but it's also nice to see these university students uh, you know, starting to get involved in, and, and, and raising their voices. And all these folks in the nice purple shirts, okay, who have continued to, to make, send this message and have educated uh, numerous people in Guam Cancer Care who help you know, people through the maze of getting care and assistance. <laughs> You know, it's all there. The only problem is we still have a high smoking rate. We still have a high utilization of tobacco. And then we have probably the most infamous, uh, you know, example of, of the tobacco industry trying to recruit new addicts with e-cigarettes. Um, so what do we really need to do? Uh, we've, we've taxed it uh, beyond my, you know, my even wildest dreams, and I guess we can tax it some more, but that, that only seems to have a, 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 an interim, you know, small-term effect, although it has an effect. I think that one of the problems that we have as a territory of the United States is that we don't have much to say about what comes into our territory in terms of products. Uh, if the United States would just have the gumption to sign that framework convention, on tobacco control, we'd have a lot more to say about how things are advertised, where they're placed, because it's really what you, what you see every day uh, is what you know what stays in your head, and you know when it continues to, you go to any mom and pop store and you see the windows are plastered with you know with cigarette, tobacco and and uh, alcohol and beer and ads, you know you can't even see into the into the store. So until we do something about that. And about our, you know, our ability to to deal with the federal government in terms of what we allow into our territory, and we have the same problem with American Samoa and a little bit with CNMI. But you know, at least our brothers and sisters in the FSM and the, and the, and the Marshals and in Palau have have a lot more to say about how things are done there. And until we get that, until we can say to somebody in a, in a mom and pop store, all your cigarette products have to be in the back behind a, a curtain, just like you do with the X-rated films. We're, we're just not gonna have that impact. And, and there's so many other countries that have already signed this convention, uh, you know, that, I mean, we're embarrassed. And, and the same man who sits in the White House now as a senator was demanding that this, this, that the Congress uh, do something about this. And now as a president, and I guess being more aware of the realities of, of, of economics and free trade and all of this, this nice sounding stuff, uh, doesn't realize, well, he does, but I mean, it, it, and I don't know if it gets any better because we're talking about big dollars, big money. And as a small community of 176,000 people, I guess we don't amount to much. Uh, I, I know and I applaud you, uh, Vice Speaker, twice now you've, you've sponsored a resolution uh, and it made, made it very clear <laughs> that, you know, we, we really demand some action on this and they, they just don't pay attention. So I don't know if we, if we again, look at certain parts of that framework convention and, and again, try to enact some of those again within, you know, as we've done with clean air and, and, and uh, smoking in front of public buildings and, and these kind of things. That has some effect. but. Until we make the product very difficult to access, until we actually put packaging that shows, you know, what the effects are, we, we run these ads uh, in in sometimes decent time slots where you see what the effects of smoking have done to people with strokes and with with uh, heart disease and all of this. But 
you know, the messaging still, it, the, the money that's spent on that messaging means nothing because the tobacco industry has just, you know, continued to work, is way ahead of the curve on, on us. And I, I, you know, I wish I had a solution to this, but it's a whole of society thing. It's not just cancer. It's not just tobacco control. I mean, you're right. You see a couple in a, in a car parked and, and they're smoking. I do my old man shuffle down in Tumont every day and that's all I see, younger and younger people smoking and with their children right there. Um, you know, it's not just a, it's not just an uncle thing anymore. It's where our kids are still smoking in, in fairly high numbers and you know, it's it's almost to the point where I, I almost throw up my hands as a public health guy and say, What what do we do about it? You know, I don't wanna be the you know, the person who, who it's kind of like, you know, they, they call me the food police and they call me the, the health police and all this kind of stuff. But it, really, we've got to start looking at what we have, what ability we have to control what comes into where we live. And a lot of it is, is beyond our control. We had a situation with, with you know, it's not directly related to, to this, but it's related to our, our relationship with the United States. We had two uh, MERS COVID contacts from Korea, and I, I know that was all played up in, in the media, but we have no way to control or protect our borders. We were stuck between two countries, the United States and South Korea, and um, we had to take the brunt and the expense of trying to, trying to control uh, the access to those contacts. So again, uh, we, we need to rework our relationship with the United States. We have to have some way of, again, determining how we're going to, you know, and how, what is going to be allowed into our, into our territory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Gillen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. McNich, is Mary Lou Martinez. Juanita Blas. Thank you, Senators. My name is Ron McNinch, and uh, I'm talking to you today just as a, a general private citizen, just with some general views. I did need to point out, Dr. Gillen's also the pot police. You know, he's been assigned that role, certainly, by the people of Guam, too. So, uh, you know, he... He, he does wear many hats as does public health. In general, I, I went through the bill and I did a, a basic overview of the bill. There's a lot of details that need to be uh, worked out on this bill in order for it to be functional. And I do have some pretty strong concerns about it. I think that it needs to go and really be worked with all the right people in the right room to really make it a piece of legislation that will really work for Guam. And that's my main input today is that I do have, uh, I think, Conceptually, it's, it's, it's public health or the, having a health or having a public that has access to good health is good. Uh, restricting tobacco is fine. It's just working out the details to make this policy uh, be effective and functional and, and practice not so much through enforcement of externals but enforcement of internals. That is, people know the right thing to do and the right thing to do is not to smoke around kids and the right thing to do is not to, to smoke in cars with kids and things like that. And I'd much prefer to see uh, groups like our young social workers enforcing those kinds of things than to see police officers enforce them. And so the penalty might be that uh, rather than be fined, they have to receive some sort of training or, or parenting education or something like that. We need to talk about more alternatives than simply looking at it from the uh, normal context of policemen's going to find somebody for doing something wrong or, or something like that. And so that's my input. I just believe that uh, more communication, some more discussions on this particular bill would make it a much better bill than it, in my view than it currently is. And that's all I had to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Ms. Martinez? Good afternoon. My name is Mary Lou Martinez, and I, I represent um, a rather new um, nonprofit organization called the um, Women's Resource Center. Um, and we support this bill. And um, wholeheartedly, but we also ask your consideration um, to a request of adding um, the following to section 11, nine, um, section or line number 90114 of chapter 90. And that um, line and number 
90114 reads, <clears throat> Prohibition of smoking in a vehicle when a child is present. And we would like um, to co for you to consider adding or and or a pregnant woman. Also under that, um, Section A, smoking is prohibited in a motor vehicle if a child is 17 years of age or younger and include and or a pregnant woman regardless of age present in the vehicle reg regardless of whether the vehicle is moving or stationary. So we, we all have sisters, daughters, cousins and family, sisters-in-laws of childbearing age as well as children or grandchildren nephews or nieces who may be underage. And thanks to the enactment of laws like the Natasha Protection Act, there are more public places, buildings, rooms, and recreational areas where one can comfortably and healthfully be in or be close to without being exposed to secondhand cigarette smoke. There are numerous medical studies and research which point to the adverse effects caused by secondhand smoke affecting not only the pregnant mother, but also her unborn baby. The official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a pediatric publication <clears throat> in 2011 entitled, Secondhand Smoke and Adverse Fetal Outcomes in Non-Smoking non Pregnant Mother, a Meta-Analysis. And their work was supported by the UK Center for Tobacco Control Studies. And this was their conclusions. Our result provide confirmatory evidence that there are further adverse effects of maternal secondhand smoke exposure during pregnancy on the health of the fetus through increased risks, risks of congenital malformations, stillbirths, and possibly other adverse fetal outcomes. And I, in, in the written, um, copy that I sent over email, I, I provide a copy of this article. Throughout my young adult years, I experienced, you know, skull pounding and throbbing, headaches and sinus issues whenever I was around secondhand smoke. But what was also puzzling was that I would experience the same symptoms when I would be in a room where there would no be, not be any cigarette smoke, though the room did emit a smell of cigarette smoke. I later discovered that these same symptoms I experienced when there would be only lingering smell of the cigarette in the room but no smoke were caused not by secondhand smoke but from what is referred to as thirdhand smoke. Today, there are emerging medical studies that pinpoint and claim that thirdhand smoke also causes risks and dangers to the unborn babies lungs, and general health. One such study I cite is from the Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. One of their studies found that prenatal exposure to toxic components of a newly recognized category of tobacco, known as third-hand smoke, can have a serious or even more negative impact on an infant's lung development as, as postnatal or childhood exposure is to smoke. Their study went on to point out that third-hand smoke comes about from the newly formed toxins. Okay. From the newly formed toxins um, from tobacco smoke, which remains on furniture, in the upholstery of cars, on clothing, and other surfaces, long after smokers have finished their cigarettes. These stilt toxins, they say, lingers on the surface of homes, hotels, and cars used by smokers where children, the elderly, and other vulnerable people may be exposed to the toxins without their realizing the dangers. They advise that pregnant women should avoid places where third-hand smoke is found so as to protect their unborn. They conclude that based on their study, prenatal disruption of lung development can lead to asthma and other respiratory ailments that can last a lifetime. When I experienced my headaches, I could choose to move out of the room or not to enter a room that I know um, may have had smokers. But the unborn cannot do that. 
and they rely on the decisions of their pregnant mother. Our children, the unborn and born babies, are not only our future, but they are our most precious gifts from God. Therefore, when we take measures to protect them from the chemicals and toxins emitted by our lifestyles, we ultimately also protect and safeguard our environment as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Martinez. Juanita? Half a day. Um, my son's going to get mad. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Island Girl Power as well as myself as a mother of six. And um, there he is. Um, yeah, we are here. Um, can you say your name? I'm Jofus. He's Jofus. And so um, with my work uh, 15 years with Island Girl Power, one of our main missions has been to reduce the usage of alcohol and tobacco among our young ladies. Um, and of course, um, inspiring the community to make positive choices. And um, it's through the work with public health and the NCD and also our work with peace that we've been able to um, work towards a future with programs possibly funded in order to achieve those missions. But um, you know what Mr. Gillen had said about our environmental situations. Um, if we don't change social norms, then it would almost be um, detrimental for us to try to enforce laws. And we'll always come up with not being able to enforce them or, or having a difficult time getting the community's buy-in on these laws. It'll be us against them. And so changing the so social norms goes back to everything Mr. Gillen said about signage. You pass by the mom and pop stores. You have situations where people who are trying to quit are constantly bombarded by media that focuses on promoting cigarettes um, and alcohol. So we really, really want to make a change and have our communities appear healthier as to convince the communities to become healthier. Um, you must first provide the environment that fosters healthy living um, in order to encourage people to stay on the right track. Um, people who are um, on drug and alcohol recovery a lot of the times fall back on cigarettes as a way to cope. And if we allow them to continue to cope with cigarettes, then it allows them to have health risks um, that, that will eventually affect the whole family. Um, we're collecting uh, signatures to also increase the smoking age to 21, and we're going to continue to collect the signatures, the petition from kids and adults, um, until that law comes up or that bill comes up for review. But I really want to encourage um, the senators to just support the organizations that are out there, NCD, the Peace Office. We need all the support we can get, so programs as small as ours. We have a lot of name recognition, but we also have a lot of volunteers. And so funding for paid staff um, so that we can do more is not as easily accessible, but you have treatment that is funded. But prevention is not really on the radar still, not as much. So, you know, just encourage you to support what you can to allow us to continue to fight the good fight and do the right thing in the community. Uh, the Natasha Act was a beautiful blessing in 2005. Um, but I constantly walk into stores with my children and right at the entrance are people smoking. 20 feet is uh, almost funny because you walk in and you bring the smoke in, you, in with you when you go into the store. You go to a, a public establishment, a government agency, you come out from Department of Revenue and Taxation, and you're bombarded with smoke because they're 20 feet away, but they're still at the entrance. So let's try to enforce it, but even then it's a far cry from what the healthy environment we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juanita, and to Jofis. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Annette David, she's not here, but uh, we have Chris Serla to read her testimony. 
And if there's anyone else um, that wishes to provide oral testimony, I invite you to please come forward. <coughs> Sorry, um, Dr. David apologizes for not being able to be here. Um, her flight got delayed, um, but she did text us the, um, her written testimony. So uh, thank you for allowing me to, um, to read it. As chair of the Guam State Epidemiolog Epidemiology Outcomes Work Group, member of the ACS Advisory Group, and a public health physician for health partners, I strongly and fully support Bill 143-33. Guam's data consistently highlights tobacco-related cancer as a major cause of death, disease, and suffering for our community. Cancer risk from tobacco comes from direct exposure and secondhand exposure. The Natasha Act was a milestone in legislative protection against secondhand smoke, but its exemptions represent gaps that leave certain groups of our people at risk. Removing the exemptions from, from bars closes the largest gap and makes the law protective, the law's protective function more equitable. Enforcement is also critical. A poorly or inconsistently enforced law leaves our community vulnerable to the harms from secondhand smoke. Addressing enforcement capacity and expanding the enforcement authority is essential for the law to work effectively. Finally, protecting children and vehicles from secondhand smoke is an ethical responsibility. Making smoking in these vehicles a primary violation extends the legal protection to a highly vulnerable group. In the event that their parents and families fail to keep them safe from secondhand smoke. These revisions to the Nat Natasha Act showcase the enlightened leadership of our senators who recognize that our committee need healthy people to achieve economic and social progress. Thank you, Senator Rodri Rodriguez and colleagues for your championship for a healthier and more prosper prosperous Guam. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chris, and thank you to Dr. Tabin for that. Um, anyone else wish to provide oral testimony? Please come forward, um, Vice Speaker. Any comments or questions? You good, Senator? No. Okay. Um, if there's, then we can um, conclude this public hearing. But before that, I just want to thank you all again, uh, the UOG students um, who are here, um, NCD. You guys know that you're really, you're truly uh, our inspiration. You know, <laughs> in getting um, all these um, initiatives um, to move forward. And, you know, I don't uh, believe in coincidence, right? But when we introduced this, the bill number, Rosie, was, um, was the first to 143. So it's about love, right? So it's about uh, just loving our, our community, loving our neighbors. And so I um, want to just thank you all uh, again for your support, uh, for your support in coming today, but also in helping craft this legislation. Uh, we may need to um, tweak it a little bit more, get more input from the community. Uh, we want to make sure that no one feels like um, you know they were left out. So we'll give the community more and more uh, time to provide testimony. But my commitment is to move this forward so that um, you know we can um, finally get this through. Okay. So Senator Underwood, Vice Speaker, thank you. Also, um, this now concludes our public hearing. Um, for those who wish to provide um, testimony, they may do so uh, written testimony and provide it directly to my office. Okay. The time now is 3 p.m. We're adjourned. <laughs>